Hey there, it's Jean with Waldorf Inspired Learning, and I'm so excited today to be having a conversation with Janet Langley, one of the authors of The Roadmap to Literacy. So this is a, a newish book, right, that um, just came out last summer, and it's all about teaching language arts in grades one through three um, from the wall with the Waldorf approach. So hi, Janet. <laughs> Hello there. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's so nice to have you here. I'm really excited to have this conversation because I, before I started homeschooling my kids, I was a high school English teacher. And so when I first found Waldorf, I too had this question about, well, wait a minute, this is the exact same approach we're supposed to use in the English language that was used with the German language? Like that just didn't, makes sense to me but i couldn't quite quite figure it out so this is such a wonderful book um and such a great resource so first i just want to say welcome to janet she has been uh, a waldorf classroom teacher and a mentor to teachers and she co-wrote the book the roadmap to literacy with uh jennifer millitzer copperall and here is a copy of my copy of the book and uh and the two of them uh so so jennifer's a remedial specialist right but both janet and jennifer both offer authors have been uh waldorf classroom teachers so how did you meet jennifer i'd love to hear you tell us about that first well um Many years before the book actually had its birthing, Jennifer assessed one of my students, and uh, and I was impressed with the work that she did. But then we didn't see each other for years, and about six years ago, we ended up at the same school where I was the pedagogical director um, uh, temporarily, and she was a remedial specialist. <clears throat> and so, um, between the time that she had assessed my student and we met up again, I had been spending probably about 10 years traveling the Western United States, wow. many schools, mentoring, doing workshops, evaluations. And one of the things I was coming across over and over and over again was the fact that all of these students were needing to be pulled out of class for remedial language arts. And I know that I had worked really hard creating my own language arts curriculum in the lower grades because there, there really wasn't one um, mm. provided by Steiner beyond the alphabet, which I didn't quite understand, but I was too busy teaching to you know, really worry about it. But yeah. now that I was out there as a mentor, I realized, wow, this is, seems to be a real problem. Everyone's mm -hmm. reinventing the bill. Everyone's trying to figure out well, how to teach um, language skills. And it didn't matter what school, what training the teacher had. So interesting because among homeschoolers, it's always that question of, okay, I know we're supposed to introduce the letters, but then what? So it's yeah. really quite, you know, quite, uh similar i can imagine if they were in a classroom maybe you know the same yeah, yeah. and yeah. needing some extra help at that point right right and you know and for and one thing is that i mean the teachers were working really hard and they were smart and it, it wasn't as though uh you know they weren't trying <laughs> so yeah. anyway i um when I asked Jennifer this question, she just kind of laughed and said, I've been waiting for years for someone to ask me that question. She said, the reason that we can't use Steiner's indications to teach English is that English is not German. And all of a sudden I got chills and I thought, yeah. okay, tell me more. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then she um, proceeded to share with me different aspects about the difference between German and English, which we'll go into a little bit later in um, our interview. And it just happened to be that at that time, a man named Christoph Fiekert um, was visiting that school. And Chris, Christoph and I had um, a, a professional relationship. He, I almost considered him my mentor mm -hmm. um, for a number of years. And so when I shared this information with him, Oh, for, I'm sorry. He, Christoph had just retired as the director of the pedagogical section 
of the Anthroposophic Society, and that group was tasked with basically overseeing and supporting Waldorf education around the world. Mm -hmm. So you don't get much more knowledgeable and <laughs> okay. that, right and, and involved. So when I shared uh, Jennifer's um, observations with him, he said, I want to talk to her. Let's talk. So we had a conversation and she explained to him what English teachers were up against, that German teachers were not. And he was actually pretty blown away. And he said, the two of you have got to research this and then you've got to write a book. You've got to get this out into the Waldorf community to help the teachers. And at that point, I was thinking maybe we were thinking, looking at maybe a year and a half project, a possibly 180 page book, you know, um, which is typical, I think, for resource books in the Waldorf world. And um, as your, uh, uh, as your um, viewers probably notice when you picked up that book, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's 605 pages. It is a tome. Yes. And uh, so we began working on this project um, and it took us five and a half years of research and writing to actually cover everything that needed to be covered. Um, I, I, at one point I started tracking. I think we're definitely over 14,000 hours into research and writing oh my on God. the book. Uh, and our life circumstances were just such that we could, we could both do that. I had to care for an elderly parent and so I was home. Um, yeah. But anyway, so that's how we met and that's how the book was birthed. That is such a great story because it's um, so, it's so uh, telling when we think that we can just dive in. Oh, this you know this will be a simple project. We'll be able to explain it in in a very clear way. And then you had to really keep going deeper and deeper. And it really speaks to. So my next question really is then, tell us about the difference between English and German because it. It clearly, the two languages are very different. And I remember being so surprised by reading that in the book that a child in, can learn German in like easily within a year, right? 98% or something of the sounds. And the English language is so different than that. Right, right, yes. With, with German, which is the language of Rudolf Steiner and the original Waldorf School, um, <clears throat> The German language is almost completely phonetic. So every single letter has only one sound. And when you look at a word, every letter is sounded. Mm -hmm. So B is, you know, there was such an emphasis on articulate speech and speech in the Waldorf early curriculum. And a big part of that was the fact that if you could speak clearly and the children heard the sounds of the word, then they would know what letter spelled that word. And so when we say that um, a German child, after one year of instruction, uh, they can read uh, common German words with, and spell them with a 98% accuracy. As we all know, that's not, <laughs> you know, after one year of instruction, that's not exactly where our students are. I think we're at about a 33% accuracy um, for common English words. So after one year? After one year. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very different. It's um, very different. Yeah. Yes. So here you have this very phonetic language, mm -hmm. and uh, and it definitely it has some silent letters. It has some rules, but they're they're always true. For example, with the German, if you have I and E in a word like Christoph Wieker, mm -hmm. I E, yeah, then the second vowel always says it gives the sound, and the first vowel is silent. Yeah. Um, instead of I before E, except after C, and when sounding like ways, and yeah, um, you know, um, so uh, if they have uh, something like that, a convention, it's like always that way, <laughs> which makes it really nice. Um, however, oh, in fact, interesting fact, in written German language, all of the nouns in a sentence are capitalized. Oh my God. You don't have to hunt for them. They're just capitalized. That's so clear. <laughs> yeah, really. Great so, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. I, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, that is but funny. so then we look at the English language. And mm -hmm. our language, we have 26 letters. 
Right. And those 26 letters, either singularly or combined, make 44 sounds. So all of the words in our language are made up of these 44 sounds called phonemes. Right. And um, so not only do the children have to learn the 26 letters, but they have to learn the 44 sounds and how to spell those so that they can actually put them together and, and spell words or look at, at how the word is laid out and figure out how to decode or read it. But then we're further compu uh, you know, um, complicated by the fact that those 44 sounds can be spelled over 220 ways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you think about O, long O. It can be spelled O as an ocean. It could be spelled um, comb as in C-O-M-B. It can be spelled though, O-U-G-H. It can be spelled snow, O-W. Um, uh, what, uh, don't, O with yeah, the E. So I mean, you know, so. Right. So how the many literacy ways? journey in English, how long would you say that is then? As opposed to in German? As yeah. Um, so. If you are following the curriculum in the Roadmap to Literacy, which is really laid out very systematically, we spend hundreds of hours researching and figuring out exactly what phonics rule should be taught, mm -hmm. in what order, because there are prerequisites that can help you learn the phonics rules easier right. if you have these prerequisites. Um, and so by the end of the third grade, about our three years of instruction, children should be able to read. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it crack the code, uh, but they should be able to read and, and sound out most words in our language. Now, they may not understand them, but once they've been taught how to, to um, you know, syllabicate, then they can figure out how to sound out a word, mm -hmm. even if they don't know what it, um, what it means. Uh, so three years for, for reading, but it takes six years for children to be able to use all of those phonics skills, all of those rules and their exceptions <laughs> to be able to spell at the same rate they can read. Yeah. So for a child to spell as well as they read at probably through sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And that's a such a, like, if when we look at it that way, it shifts how we perceive, like, what a child should be doing, right? right. Like, it, right. it gives us so much more permission to see that this is a much longer journey. I remember uh, reading at some point... Um, somewhere in my in my journey with the Waldorf approach that about you know that those pre-literacy skills in kindergarten are so important too because mm -hmm. that a child about after about four years of of some of those pre-literacy activities then they're primed you know that they can begin to um interact with and understand some of these uh reading conventions like it's just a much longer process right it is that then um then our world especially the mainstream world but really then our world um allows for you know in, yes. in speaking language sure. so that is so fascinating. Okay, so we have some slides prepared. Thank you to Gina and Jennifer. And so I'm going to share these now and we're going to talk more, sorry, we're going to talk more specifically about um, some of the what's in the book. So I'm really excited about that prospect. So here we go. Here is the cover of the Roadmap to Literacy. Yes. Teaching yes. language arts in grades one through three. So um, there's also this statistic uh, about, you know, that a certain percentage of children are going to learn to read on their own. Some need extra practice and then some need extra help. Right. And I found that to be really fascinating, too. I think of my own three children and they probably just coincidentally, each of them follow, falls into one of those uh, oh. categories, right? The, the, uh -huh. um, the, or, or maybe in the first two, like read on their own and have some extra practice. But uh -huh. 
It's mm-hmm. so, that's so interesting. And one of the things I love about the book uh, is that it is both um, like a textbook, like teaches us how to do it, but then it's also just an unbelievably fabulous reference uh, resource to have um, when we do, you know, if we do find that we have a child who needs some extra practice and help. Right, right. Okay, yeah. so, so- Could I say something about the, the picture? Yeah, oh, so please do. So this, at the, end of the, at the end of the slide presentation, there's actually a picture of the book where you see this picture on the cover, but um, one of my graduates is a professional artist, and I asked her if she would be willing to design the cover um, art. And we had, Jennifer and I sat down with her for, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, and we explained what our book was about. And the fact that um, if, well, we wanted the picture to sort of be a metaphor for the fact that if you, set out on this literacy journey if you don't have a road map you could end up in the brambles like from the house it, you could wind up in the brambles or you could end up going back into a cave there's a dragon around the cave um, or you could go get to the bridge and go across the bridge but end up winding your way around the hillside for a very long time before you ended up getting to the castle or crack the code and um, so she went home with just that kind of idea without we talked about brambles, mountains, wandering around. And she came up with this metaphor, this beautiful picture yeah. that uh, shows the fact that teaching English will never be a straight arrow shot uh, because it has so many twists and turns to it. Yeah. But if you have a roadmap, then it, it'll be the shortest distance there. <laughs> yes, and that also reminds me of the, the comment that I made, how um, that's one of the things that, that I love about the Waldorf kindergarten, but a lot of homeschoolers in particular, um, really even kids, parents who send their kids to a Waldorf school, they, they say, well, what exactly is happening in, in a Waldorf kindergarten, right? But it is part of the journey. It's part oh, yes. of the journey when you, we're exposing children to rhythm and rhyme and, um, you know, verses and songs and movement games and all of those things so right right absolutely in fact the develop of phonological awareness which really has is about the the, um the sound of our language uh how our sound our language is broken up into different um words and then the words into different sound chunks and um also when we think about rhyming that has a lot to do with also the prerequisite for uh, onset and rhyme and patterns, hat, sat, chat. I think we call them word families in yeah. uh, the Waldorf world, but there is so much that the children are doing in the kindergarten to prepare them for early literacy. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the last couple of weeks I've been at a charter school and an independent school and met with the early childhood faculty to um, encourage them to really sort of take this work up in a a a real conscious way because as the way it has been designed it naturally does um uh does a lot to prepare the children for um their sort of official literacy training Mm -hmm. but if a kindergarten teacher realized that by choosing certain nursery rhymes that had different rhyming schemes and that throughout the year they covered a lot of the different rhyming or word family patterns that they could really even be more uh, effective in preparing the children. So there's quite a few things that kindergarten teachers can do mm-hmm. uh, Interesting. that's really within what they, their training right, to right. early literacy. Yeah. Well, let's really dive into the book. Um, and these yeah. are the five phases. So this is super helpful, I think, um, to look at each individual uh, phase. And children, mm-hmm. um, this, this is really that journey, right? Children progress through these phases. Um, right. And perhaps at different times, but generally speaking, right, they're going to work through uh, at least the majority of these um, in those first three grades, right? Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, the first three and half of the fourth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So I could, uh, maybe I could talk a little bit about each one of these. Please. please. Um, mm -hmm. the, the emergent phase is really that phase that most of our children are in when they enter into first grade. And this means that they, when they first enter in, um, typically, they might know how to write their name. They would recognize it, uh, not really as a word, but as a picture. Uh, they see their word, their name, and they it's a whole picture for them. Um, they're very clued into uh, logos, Starbucks, McDonald's. My three-year-old grandson could see a Starbucks a mile away, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, and they might know a few letters, uh, but really uh, they're very um, much more advanced in their listening capacity and their speaking capacity. Uh, children are born wired for sound and visual input in memory and that's what they've been relying on um, up until the point where they enter into formal uh, first grader uh, uh, education. So yeah. this emergent phase is it's really interesting in that it's qualitative. Uh, we say that you, we are teaching in the emergent phase, but what we're doing is we're introducing the alphabet. And the um, what the goal of the emergent phase is for children to understand that we speak in sentences, that sentences are composed of words, that words are made up of sound chunks, and these words are, are um, spelled using letters there is so a, this is a really that letter introduction right yes that happens in first grade yeah yes yes and and the and the thing is is that the, we know when a student is ready to move on to the phonemic awareness phase from the emergent phase when all of a sudden they get it oh letters each letter up there in the alphabet that's above my blackboard the is has is uh, connected to a sound and so if that letter is in a word it's making that sound right. and so it's this a letter to sound relationship and yeah. um yeah. and then the sort of assessment of having completed the emergent phase is that a student can hear a, a word um, isolate the beginning sound of the word, tell you what letter that, that, that makes that sound, and then can write the upper and lower case, in, in the case of our book, but can write the letter that makes that sound. So it's, here's the word that sounded, they can hear the first sound, right? and then they can tell you what letter makes that sound and write it. Um, and usually, lots of times, students, by the time um, they've been introduced to eight, ten consonants right. in that very first block, they got it. Yeah. They, they got, you know, they got it. Yeah. And, and even Steiner said, you know, show them these letter how the letters emerge from pictures as an example like you don't have to do the whole like move on from there yes. right which yes. is yes. so interesting but it's often again it, you know it's great to have a book like this because it um there it's so often people say okay well i introduced the letters now what do i do so yeah, yeah. so the exactly. phonemic awareness then how do we work through that phase right in fact i i just might i just might mention that i think one of the reasons that American or English speaking Waldorf teachers have have drug out this phase of introducing absolutely every single letter out of an image from a fairy tale um, and that can take at least till spring break mm -hmm. of first grade is that they didn't know where to go. That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, I totally you know, what, what, what do I do next? So right. I just keep on doing this. And yeah, and like you say, Steiner did say do eight or ten um bring them out of the image and there are some letters that actually work better right for, yeah for like a bear and, and a b and the mountain and the m um right. the um r and the robin not so much so uh, 
<laughs> you know, yeah. the Jay and the Jester. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> you know, or braid coming down in an R. Um, anyway, so uh, we can choose wisely and choose those consonants mm -hmm. to begin with that actually really lend them from fairy tales yeah. that um, that the students can then associate. And by the uh, but by the end of that time, they pretty they've got the emergent face. They've got sound letter. Um, you know awareness and so they're ready to move up to the next phase of um, instruction mm -hmm. um, developmentally they're ready for this to hold them later longer into the emergent phase it's not it's wasting everybody's time mm -hmm. so then with the phonemic awareness phase here you still have to teach the rest of the letters of the alphabet Mm -hmm. and uh, but along with that you can begin doing kid writing um, and a number of, and then after the alphabet, you can begin to introduce um, uh, the beginning of the phonics rules. And these phonics rules, for the most part, really are providing the rest of those 44 um, oh, phonemes wow. yes. in our language. Yeah. Uh, the, alphabet, the alphabet with its long, short vowel uh, sounds and the consonant sounds only provides 28 of the 44. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's our job. We're not done in first grade right. when we've introduced the alphabet. Right. We've got more to do here. Yeah. So well, right, and and I love the note that you know in in German, <laughs> you are almost done, right? By by that pattern phase, but not in English. No, 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 no. Um, yeah. So so in the phonemic awareness phase, once the rest of the alphabet has been introduced, then we begin. Um, working with CV, uh, CVC words because now they have consonants and vowels. So consonant, vowel, consonant words such as hat, cat, dog, right, um, hop. Uh, and so we're going to really be working with those. And then we're going to be starting to, uh, once the children really get that, they, they can put, uh, sound out these phonemes, uh, these consonant, vowel, consonants, and they can blend them together and they can, um, you know, they, they can hear one of the words and they can write it down or they can, uh, called encoding, or they can uh, see the word and they can sound it out. Right. Once they're really developing, a they have a facileness with that, then they start to work into these phonic skills. And uh, for example, we'll teach them digraphs. And digraphs are ch wa mm -hmm. um, and and if we think about it, these truly are their own separate sounds in our language. It's not ka -ha. Right, right, exactly. Right? It's not and two sounds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's truly one sound oh, spelled no. with these two letters. And, right. of course, as we're teaching them um, all of this, that the end of the phonemic awareness phase, the goal is that we have taught them all of the sounds the 44 phonemes of our language mm -hmm. and they have when we practiced it enough that they could in fact sound out any sort of simple word that they would want to write right. um right. that is phonetically correct they're using something that you could understand maybe it's phone the word is phone and it's f-o-n mm -hmm. Um, and if they've learned the silent E, then maybe even put the E on there at the end. Um, but they will be able to spell, um, a, you know, the words in a sentence. So in a, right. We could recognize it. Yeah. It will, yeah. That, that there is a sound for every letter. That yes. is sound. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So then so the pattern phase. Yeah. So once we have all the 44 um, sounds that we can start working with, now we need to look at the two kinds of patterns yeah. that make up our English language. And if you read the roadmap to literacy, this is really the phase that the French brought to us when uh, the French um, conquered England and uh, ended up um, bringing the French language and it sort of merged into the English language over a period of about 400 years mm -hmm. and the French have a lot of vowel teams they have uh, that spell one sound they have a lot of silent letters um, so they're they certainly brought 
complication <laughs> and to Much our language. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. Words like lieutenant and sergeant and oh, yeah. lots of words. So right. one of the things we, we're going to be looking at, at two different things really here in this pattern phase. The children are going to learn all of those, um, all of those phonics rules mm -hmm. that govern how to spell long vowels. So they'll learn to when two vowels go walking, the second one does the talking and, and mm -hmm. usually says its name. So like float, <laughs> right? right? Um, uh, I mean, the first one does the talking. I'm sorry. Um, and C, S-E-A. E is the one that does the talking. And Bay, B-A-Y, A does the talking. And so, um, I was back in the German for a minute. Uh, <laughs> so, so we're going to be looking at all of these these different uh, patterns mm -hmm. that um, inform how our our language is spelled through these long vowel patterns. Yeah. And uh, whereas in the phonemic awareness phase, I ha I forgot to mention this, but the emphasis is completely on the short vowels. There right. is yeah only yes. one way to spell a. Ah. Mm -hmm. There are numerous ways to spell a yes as we or oh as we talked about before oh, so yes. um, the other thing is that we'll be looking at uh, at what's called onset and rhyme mm -hmm. which is uh, how that will really build children's fl uh, fluency and this would be so for example in that word the float family that is an example of OA Two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking and says its name. But that's also the example of an onset in rhyme. So the rhyme would be oat, and we could have many words, boat, coat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and float. Here we, and so uh, it's the way of being able to look, to chunk out a word, to be able to right. look at OAT and know that says oat. So anytime. I see a word with oat. I don't have to sound it out. Oh, oh, I know that's oat. And yeah. then I, all I have to do is look at the onset, which are the consonants that come before the vowel. Yes. So it's like and, combining the, the phonemes, but not having to isolate them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We want to isolate them in the phonemic awareness phase. Right. We want to combine them yeah. Um, yeah. in yeah. patterns in yeah. the... Um, pattern face yeah. and this really is you know will help children with fluency as they're yeah. beginning yeah. to read um okay. we end the pattern phase with yeah go uh, ahead. Well, well we just homophones yeah and yeah. um and you can't i know that first time around i introduced homophones before i introduced all of the all of these vowel teams and the reason homophones exist is really they use different vowel teams so yeah. it's it didn't make a lot of sense, but I didn't know better <laughs> um, at the time. Um, okay, so then but, you're getting into more complicated syllable patterns. Yes, the syllable phase. Um, oh, I might say that with the pattern phase, when uh, the students can decode, uh, read any, just any, um, <coughs> um, oh, like a one syllable or two syllable word that uses um, these different vowel teams and um, and yeah they're you know they're it's they're really close to cracking the code at this point they're sounding outward slowly but they're able to do it mm -hmm. the syllable phase now this is an interesting one because it for it for reading it will only take about a, a year, year and a half, probably, mm -hmm. for a child to move through the syllable phase as far as reading goes, to where they can look at a word, oh, they wow. have the, the syllabication skills to be able to sound it all out and figure out how to, to read it. But the spelling yeah. part of the syllable phase, as I mentioned earlier, will last until probably sixth grade. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and a lot longer. And what will happen is that um, in the roadmap to literacy, we have 32 phonic skills that we need to teach students to um, to reach the end of this syllable phase. Mm -hmm. However, children will be able to decode using these much faster and easier 
then they'll be able to spell correctly with them. Yeah. That's why it would take longer yeah. Um, yeah. To, uh, to get through that, the um, encoding or the spelling, spelling. part. Yes, yes. got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so then the Latin and Greek is more for the seventh eighth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, that, and that has to do with really a, a focus on Latin and Greek roots and the fact that we have in the English language, we have many words. They're typically more sophisticated, more in the scientific world. Um, right. Uh, or, oh, all those. Know, Right, biological, zoological yeah. phrases, and yeah. yeah, all the ologies. <laughs> but yeah. so they have. Um, there are a lot of words, though, that that have this share the same uh, Latin or Greek root, and they're right. all connected in meaning, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily pronunciation. So yeah, yeah. that's why uh, you know we that's that's later down the road. <laughs> right, right. So, so the benefits of knowing these phases, talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that and how, how children go through them uh, sequentially. Right. In fact, I think this is one of the great benefits of homeschooling and that your parents should be aware of as they're working with their child is, is that um, children don't learn by grade. They do not, they do not, there's not a first grade curriculum. You cover that in first grade and then you move on to the second grade and then you teach that. Right. Uh, if we have approached it that way in the past and it's left huge holes for a lot of students that where a, a teacher would introduce a phonics skill, work with it that week or maybe two of them and work with it that week and then move on to the next. And with phonics skills, you cannot do that. Um, mm. If you want the children to truly develop full phonemic awareness and then also full uh, literacy, what we, what we have to do, and, and homeschool parents are so fortunate that they, you know, it's, they just can do this naturally, is that you teach to the child and, so your child, you introduce, say for example, you're introducing the uh, diphthongs of oi, oi, oy, and ow, o u o w, mm -hmm. and and so what we do is we can introduce those through an imagination. We talk, always teach through an image or a story, yeah, and then um, we can talk about that later if you want, um, and then. Uh, the children, once they have this image to hold on to and they get a sense of what you're talking about, then they need practice. And for some children, it, it's said that a child needs 12 to 18 exposures to a concept um, when they're first learning to read, uh, to a phonics rule, let's say, um, and before they learn it. Well, Okay, so if you have a child that learns it at 12, after 12 repetitions and exposures, well, then you can move on. But if you have a child that needs 18, then you also can hang in there with that. And, uh, and the thing in the classroom is that when we say exposures, it's focused exposures. When you're teaching 20 children, if three of them are like, you know, daydreaming out the window right. and you're going over it, that doesn't count. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think in homeschooling so often the younger ones, because they've had more exposure, are going to seemingly move through the phases more quickly. Right. If they've been right, right mm -hmm. there with you, you know, yes. um, but definitely that benefit of, of, um, working with the child at their own at their own pace right and in, in fact that's why that's why we couldn't write the roadmap to literacy for grades one grade two and grade three because in a classroom a teacher will have children in at least three of these five phases at any one time that is so interesting. Oh. yeah yeah and so you have to know the journey you um, in fact, one of the things that became very clear to me as I was doing all of this research is that in Waldorf education, for the most part, we're asked to be generalists. We're asked to learn enough about biology to be able to, or like botany, for example, to yeah. be able to give an, um, a creative, informative introduction to the subject. 
Mm -hmm. But it's, that's three to six weeks in the entire eight year journey. And then you move on. Mm -hmm. And um, so you need enough information to do an introduction to geology or Greek mythology or whatever it is. But in the early grades, in first or third grade, we're not talking about teaching subjects. We're talking about teaching skills. Oh, and wow. skills need something very different. They well, need... I think, uh, go ahead. They need... Oh, well, well they, they need repetition and ongoing repetition and practice um, until... I mean, you don't... You can teach a three a three week block in botany, and then just drop it for months and come back to it in the spring mm -hmm. and do another one. And the children don't lose anything. They don't have to have botany every day for, of the right. year. Right. But when we're talking about language skills and mathematics, te teachers, whether you're a homeschool parent or you're a class teacher in a Walter classroom. Um, you need to become a specialist. Being a generalist will not cut it because we are responsible for that journey for as long as we're teaching that group of children or that, or our child, yeah. we are responsible for these foundational skills mm -hmm. that underlie everything that will well, happen. From and that's on. why we need, you know, some guidance that's, because that's, and that's why it's a 600 page book. Right. We don't have the, the training in it. But I also think it gets back to that difference between English and German, right? Uh -huh. That yeah, well, yeah. very different um, situation for us than it was um, for the culture that Steiner was teaching or sure. guiding, right? Yeah, that, that book would be much smaller if it were... <laughs> right. <laughs> if so, that were in German. Uh, let's talk about the book now itself. Okay. Um, it is quite, uh, and I've showed it to you, it's quite the a hefty book, but it has so many wonderful sections to it. I'm going to share a couple of my own favorites in just a moment. But okay. um, so we've, we've really talked about why teaching English is such a challenge. And we've I, given um, that introduction to the five phases. Mm -hmm. So within Waldorf, one thing that I do want to touch on here is that the, the difference between... Um, bringing the lessons in the main lesson work and then doing some extra, some, some practice sessions. And it's very interesting because in, in my um, homeschooling community uh, of parents, I, we, the, that conversation about practice sessions is sort of newish, just, you know, in the past couple of years, there's a lot more conversation in the homeschooling world about it. And generally, the idea has that's been shared is that when you're in a math main lesson block, you can be doing some English practice, and when you're in a you know language arts main lesson block, doing some math practice. Absolutely. Um, but so so, do you want to say some more about like the scheduling and the and the main lesson blocks and that practice work? Well, I know that we, we've been talking about doing a podcast on how to create a practice class. A, a yeah, I'm creative. so excited about that because my, my community is, yeah, really um, interested in what, actually Janet and I are going to do two more things. We're going to do an interview about how to use the book with some real specifics um, yes. and then also an interview about how to plan a practice session. Right. So, you know, there are a couple of, I love the parts in the book about, because I'm such a planner, I teach planning, right, for homeschooling, yeah. but um, there are some great sections about uh, how to plan a main lesson block. There are templates for different blocks for different grades, and, uh, and then lots of ideas for practice sessions, too, so... Um, yeah, that's going to be great. We're going to go into that more in depth in another okay. in another yes. conversation. Yes, yeah. yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. So one of my um, favorite parts of the book is this section about working with story and this idea mm -hmm. of sacred nothings. Which, so is did Christoph um, Viker? Did he is he the one who came up with that concept? Yes. That phrase. Yes. Yeah. He. I, I was trying to think it must have been in maybe 2000 
2005. I uh, first met him, I went to a conference in Seattle, an uh, art of teaching conference in the summer, and he, and he started talking about these sacred nothings. And at that time, he was still director of the pedagogical section. Um, and it was like I had been hit by a ton of bricks. It was so exciting. I mean, it was just like, stop, think, you know, you, you need to think about everything you're doing and, um, and how exciting is this? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he actually convened a council and one of the, and their task was to really look at Waldorf education and see what needed to be, what needed to happen to mm -hmm. move it forward so that it could fulfill its destiny in the 21st century. And one of the five things they came up with was this um, getting rid of these sacred nothings or addressing them. And because so uh, there's another, there's a Waldorf teacher, um, Stephen Keith Segarin. He um, is teaches, he's on the East Coast, but he um, is a high school Waldorf teacher and he has written a number of articles about these Waldorf myths. And it's the same and concept. Yeah. And I had the exact same re reaction when I first read this first article. I was like, whoa. And for me, I've always been drawn to. Steiner's indications, like looking at what Steiner said, as opposed to looking at what's happening in the in a classroom. I mean, both are equally um, interesting and valuable. But I think so often, especially as homeschoolers, we try to copy what's happening in a classroom when, in fact, they're probably more sacred nothing by doing that than by going back to the the original indication. Yeah, there, there, and you know, the chapter in the book on on sacred nothings is so really a sacred nothings and responsible innovations because yeah. Steiner truly challenged, you know, challenged us and tasked us to continually improve Waldorf education. Mm -hmm. He was not delivering it as a done deal. Right. And that's so much of what he brought were indications. Yeah. And, and so yeah. much, I think in the, in the homeschooling world, this concept of responsible innovation is so, um, moving for us because we really are in a position to be able to look at the children in front of us and bring them what they need and that just i just want to reiterate is one of the reasons that i'm so excited about this book that it isn't just grade specific that it's this path it through it's the literacy journey and right. again as homeschoolers we can be looking at um really looking at the children in front of us and seeing where they are on the journey and bringing them what they yeah. need yeah yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so the um, with the this with the sacred nothings, this this really came to be when Christoph was director of the pedagogical council, and he came over to the United States for the first time, uh, at least in that position, and was visiting a lot of classrooms, and he kept seeing these things, you know, these teaching practices happening everywhere in all of these different classrooms. Uh, you know, different states, different schools. And he was just, why are you doing that? I mean, you know, it was like, where did you learn to do that? He, um, and, uh, and in, in many cases it's, well, that's what I was taught or that's what other people do. And, and, um, after a while he, he started collecting these and then he wrote several articles in the pedagogical journal about them. Um, and just really, uh, really, I think, those teachers that either heard him talk about them or read about them were kind of blown away that these uh, things that they had taken to be truly Waldorf and just, you know, you knew you were in a Waldorf classroom if you saw a circle at the beginning of first, second, and third right. grade. Right. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, lasting 30, 45 minutes. Um, and a circle being... Uh, you know, literally having the kids push their desk around and get in a circle and do uh, poetry and movement activities and singing. Um, and uh, anyway, he he was just, he couldn't believe. Yeah, and that, that was not a Steiner invention. Oh, no. Oh, no. In fact, he, he, makes a real, he makes a real case for the fact that that is truly um Right. Against everything Steiner talked about as well, far it's as interesting because he did, you know, Steiner did talk about ring games and how those are powerful to bring people together. You know, he was talking in more larger 
sort of community gatherings. And then he also did a lot of the verse recitation and that kind of thing to regulate the breathing. But it's actually very freeing for homeschoolers because circles in a homeschool setting, circle oh, time right. in a homeschool setting can be very challenging. Right. <laughs> so, right. so um, yeah, I love that that chapter on the sacred nothings. And, and, yes. um, and, and, and we do bring examples of the sacred nothings that he identifies that have to do with teaching literacy or impacting the schedule so we can't get to yes. what we need to get to. But um, yeah, yeah, so. That's great, that's super helpful. So we're gonna look um, just quickly at uh, the, well, oh yeah, so this is a question, I didn't wanna say this at the beginning because of this slide, but it's so <laughs> interesting because literacy encompasses language arts and literacy, you know, those phrases can be used kind of interchangeably, but encompasses so many different things, right? So many yes. different activities. So right. here are all the aspects of the language arts. Um, well, if you see the, right? <laughs> if you see, yeah, if you see the titles 15, there are not 15 listed right, there. Exactly. Um, but uh, so the book is laid out in six sections. Mm -hmm. And the slide we, we just saw slide for that. What's that? We have a slide for that. Yes. Should no, I we actually we we don't the, the okay. first okay. you go ahead. Well, the last, if you'll, if you'll flip back to the last slide. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the first section is background information. And, yep. it, and it has two different chapters in it. Why is teaching English such a challenge and an introduction to the five faces? I mean, it covers those. Yeah. Um, then in the section two, it's Waldorf methodologies. And it covers these things about wisdom of Waldorf, how to, you know, go about setting um, a schedule and the aspects of it of a day and the sacred nothings and uh, responsible innovations okay so that's Thank sections one and two clearing. yeah for clarifying yeah. Yeah. this is the largest section of the book and it's section three the 15 aspects of language arts there's a chapter for every single one of these um uh, uh topics yeah topics. and <laughs> and the grammar one the grammar chapter is about 60 pages <laughs> Uh, so this is by far the the largest um, aspect. In fact, I might just say something really quickly to the readers. If you have the Roadmap to Literacy and you find the book to be a little bit unwieldy when you're working with it, you actually could take it to a place like Kinko's and have them take it apart and put it into three different sections. You can do section one and two together, okay. section three all by itself, and then section four, five, and six um, could be together, and it would make it easier for you to manipulate and plan. So. Yes, wonderful. I do that. Yeah. Oh, that I is, do that with all big books. That's such a good tip. Okay, so the specifics of the language arts skills are in this section, which is the third section. Right. So right. how you would go about teaching the alphabet yeah. in first grade. The there's an entire yeah, chapter. Yeah. In detail about how to do that. Yeah, got it. Okay, so then here are the, the four through six sections. Yes. So my favorite, I don't know about you, but my favorite section in this book is the phonics rules. Oh, so okay. mine is the curriculum and lesson planning. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, section four was originally what I thought we were going to write. I didn't realize it was going to be more than this. But um, the thing about it is the phonics, yeah. <laughs> the thing about the phonics rules um, is that this is what has been missing in all of our Waldorf training mm -hmm. in the art of teaching and in our teacher training programs in general and in, in every book I know of um, in the Waldorf world around language arts. And it um, so it really goes step by step. Yeah. And like I said, in a very sequential way, but every single rule you're going to find the name of the rule, you're gonna find um, when you should teach it, uh, you're gonna find out how long it'll probably take your child or your class to um, learn that rule. Uh, don't move on until you've assessed they actually know it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, it will tell you that, so background and history, some of these are very interesting about why they exist. It's yeah. really nice for the teacher to know, yeah. oh, that's why that's there. Yeah. And uh, then it'll give you the, the exact rule, then it'll give you ideas for imaginations 
or an image that you could use mm -hmm. to teach it. Mm -hmm. um, then it will give you practice activities, ideas for book work, and also it ends with how to help struggling students. So every single rule in that entire section, um, which is phonemic awareness, pattern, and syllable phase, Mm -hmm. Every single one has that information for you. Yeah, and that is really helpful to be able to assess their informal assessments. They're all kinds, like ways just of assessing um, where a student is or a child is with this. And right, right. One, that is really great. Yes, um, and I have to say readers can thank Jennifer for <laughs> she has extreme organizational skills and she laid this section out and I just thought it was awesome. Yeah, that is great. Thank you, Jennifer, for sure. Yes. Okay, so then the curriculum and planning, lesson planning section um, is, like I said, is my favorite and I, and I love the templates of, yes. yeah. you know, it's just really helpful where it gives you actually um, sort of time stamps as well as, you know, in a, in a like chart form. Um, yep. You know, here's where you slot in your fairy tale and here's what you do, you know, as your activity. So that I find really, really interesting and helpful. Yes, yes. I guess maybe why that wasn't quite my favorite is because I've been doing that for so many years. Right. That it wasn't new. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. There, yeah. Are a few, there, yeah. there definitely were a few tweaks to it and we and and we do really reimagine the main lesson and also the practice class as far as how can you get the biggest bang for your buck? Yes, yeah, um, that's super helpful. And how can you work with the developing needs of the child in the realm of practice? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, I've used this actual, I use this curriculum in with teachers and watched them do it. And I've also done it myself when I was uh, practice or model teaching a class for a month and and as well as in my home school uh work and uh, boy it works it's yeah so you uh, like, homeschooled your grandchildren yes right yeah, my, i think i forgot to mention that at the beginning so how old were they well one was in the first grade and one was in the third grade that's what i was remembering so that is yes. so interesting okay so tell us briefly about the um, assessment and remediation and then we're going to begin to wrap up but okay. remember everybody we'll, we'll be back with a couple of other interviews yes. so yes so the assessment rem remediation um aspects the uh, assessment we really talk about the there's different kinds of assessments that you do you were, we're always assessing and certainly as a homeschool parent you are assessing oh my child is getting that they're not getting that here i need you know so it's very easy to assess on a minute to minute day to day basis right. but um but then there's an, a more of a formal assessment that you do, which is after you've been teaching your child for a certain amount of time to, to create something that can show you that the child actually has it. Yeah. And you're not helping them, you, you know, they're really using their own developing skills to answer those questions or to, to do whatever um, it might be. Mm -hmm. And the book has lots of ideas um, for what to do there. And then uh, the, and then there's actually a chapter on first grade assessments. What can you kind of expect that a first grader would would be able to do by the end of first grade? Mm -hmm. And uh, and we did divide up it into um, grades here, but then but again, you just move with your child and and you just provide the curriculum that they need for the next step to help them move towards full literacy. Yeah. So. Uh, but teachers in in classrooms need this for second third because of end of the year reports and right. different things right. um well and i think in a homeschool setting too though it's um like you said the day to day we can see much more clearly but to see how um i guess it's really about how they re they've retained what we did yes. earlier um that that kind of assessment is is very it's help it's very helpful i found to read this section to see um how we can bring that kind of assessment to right it. right yeah. yes because for um you know f there will come a point where your child will know that m-a-k-e spells make right. i mean you know they they'll just know it they won't have yeah. to think about it anymore okay they got that one <laughs> yeah. um yeah. 
Yeah, so the so the, the the big part of this last six section is on assessment, but the very last chapters actually can be very important. It's on remediation, and Jennifer certainly wrote most of that. I have some case studies in there, but um, and this and this has to do with if your child, if you suspect that your child has a learning challenge or isn't progressing. Um, in the way you, you would expect or the assessment chapters are talking about, um, uh, or you just you just said something's wrong, then if you go to this remediation, the remedial chapter, and it can, it will tell you about uh, different things to look for, different kinds of learning challenges, right. when you can do something, when it's time to get a professional involved. Um, it's a very valuable uh, chapter. Um, and it is so often, by someone who knows her stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jennifer, who's a remedial specialist. Um, and yeah. so often this is the question parents have is, you know, when should I, should I be worried? When should I be worried? <laughs> what should I do? You know, how do I, how do I move forward? So that's exactly, yeah, exactly. And you know, in our movement, we have something called the dreamy child that we, I don't know if you ever hear of yeah. someone saying, oh, it's just a dreamy child. Yeah. And in the, hundreds of children that I have either been involved in working with as a mentor or have taught myself. Um, I've only known two dreamy, truly dreamy children, mm. all the rest of them. And there have been dozens that people thought were dreamy. They actually had learning challenges and they were trying to obfuscate them. And so they were trying to, to you know, meld into the woodwork. They were acting out, trying to be the class clown so no one would know that they actually didn't know what it was going on. Mm -hmm. So really, I mean, one of the things we say is that if you suspect your child might have um, a learning challenge or maybe even be a dreamy child, first of all, with dreamy child, you need to check in and make sure they're actually learning everything. Mm -hmm. They just mm -hmm. are kind of slow to use it. Yeah. Um, anyway, there's a chat, there's a section on the dreamy child. If you think you have one, read it. <laughs> it's always good, right, to be yes. able to navigate that. Um, exactly. Yeah, that exactly. whole thing. So thank you. This has been You're so welcome. Great. Oh, it's and been I fun. Do wanna, I do want to point everybody in the direction of the Waldorf Inspirations website, which Janet um, has put together with another colleague, and it yes. has so many incredible um, ideas, block plans, activities, games for grades, really one through eight. And yes. it, it is so, so rich. Yeah, yeah. So Thank go you. to WaldorfInspirations.com. Some of my favorite things are the, um, there are some language arts games. I printed out a few, some spelling activities, different things that, um, you can bring to your children for either during main lesson time and or for some practice sessions. Okay. Yeah. We're going to yeah. talk more about that in our, in our next interview. So. Yes. Um, yes. I, my colleague, Patty Connolly, who I yeah. started doing training with in back in 1990 and uh, we worked together as colleagues at Cedar Springs for many years. She and I, when we finished our classroom teaching for the most part, we decided to start this website and we're basically we've shared about 50 years combined of um of I, ideas for teaching and they're all free so yeah, yeah. oh it's such Boy. a fabulous resource so and it also is the place yes you'll notice when you first go to it there's the book highlighted and you can order here it'll take you right now to Rudolf Steiner College Bookstore, and that's, they're the ones that will um, take your order and send it to you, but we're in the process of changing publishers, and so that our book can be um, accessed, printed in, uh, Engl in England or the United Kingdom, in Australia. Uh, we've had, you know, we've had requests from all over the world, and the publisher we had couldn't do that, so now um, we have a publisher which we sh it, it should be within a month that um, we'll be up and running with uh, Mill City Press. And oh, then wonderful. people can link to, we'll link to them. Okay. And then yes. you can, you can order it from wherever you are, right? Because I do. Three Waldorf Inspirations, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. go to WaldorfInspirations.com and you can get lots of extra resources, but also order your book there. Um, if you 
want a copy of the book and I'm going to stop sharing the screen and we can just come back on so that I can just say thank you. This has been You're such welcome. a great conversation and I look forward to talking more about um, the specifics of um, how to use the book and how to plan a practice session or sort of the difference between a main lesson block and a practice session. Right. Oh, I look forward to it. That'll be fun. Yeah, that will be really fun. So thank okay. you so much, Janet. Thanks You're both welcome. Janet thank you. and Jennifer for this incredible new resource in the world. I will do so. World. So, all I right. So. Sure. Take care. You Good luck to your readers. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye.